let's go back and talk about changing up some more details for the hobgoblins. Hello everyone, and welcome back down here to the Gamer Stand. With me, your host, Jordan, your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire. And I wanted to go back to a storyteller's guide bit that I was doing for a while, specifically changing up fantasy races, and I wanted to go back to talk about hobgoblins a little bit more, because one of the suggestions I had made over the course of that series, repeatedly, was looking at real-world cultures and seeing where they kind of line up with these fantasy races and their kind of stock and standard sort of cultures and seeing where they kind of lined up and made room for easier meshing and blending of the two together. And we're going to revisit that today because with Hobgoblins, one of the suggestions I'd made was meshing them with the Spartans of Greece. Now, some things to note here is that the Spartans did not see themselves as Greek. They were invaders, they were foreigners, or at least that's what they held about themselves. And all the Greeks of the various other city-states were helots slaves. They were fit only to be their slaves and would be conquered and subjugated as such. Hence, they had such a strictly rigidly militaristic society that focused having so many of their males fo uh, just diving headlong into warfare and that seeking of physical perfection and that full-time devotion to that warfare duty. Now, there's more details to all of this, but before we get into all of that, if you're new here to the channel, go on down there, hit the subscribe button, and become a regular member here at the Gamer's Den. Or if you've already gone on ahead and listed yourself on such an incredible roster of legendary heroes, then go on down to hit the like button and share the video far and wide. But now, let's start digging a little bit more into this, because, again, one of the reasons why I suggested looking at real-world cultures is to see where you can easily blend different things that kind of line up already, and then just mesh it all together and get things mixed up to create something that at least feels new and more distinct. But that does require that you learn a little bit more about these different cultures. And so, with regards to the Greeks and what we can, or at least the Spartans and what we can take from them and apply to the Hobgoblins, goblins to help give them more details and make them much more so much more different and new and feeling kind of fresh for your players is to look at Greek society and so with that in mind one of the most notable things about the Spartans other than their antagonistic stance with the Greeks and why they were so militaristically focused is that the, uh, women held a very dominant position in their society, something that really horrified the rest of the Greek city-states. And what this was, this was because Spartan women were allowed to remarry. And this makes a certain amount of sense if you, if you think about it a little bit, because Spartan men were expected to gl give their lives gloriously in battle, not through uh, reckless stupidity and suicidal charges. No, they were to pay, uh, pay with their lives and exact a deadly toll from the enemies that they were fighting. So, because Spartan men were in such a dangerous profession, they, uh, however great they were at it, however well equipped and experienced and ferocious they were, they died. They would die. And so you have these Spartan women of elevated status whose husbands had died. Well, those women are still able to bear children, so they were allowed to remarry. But not only were they allowed to remarry, but they had inherited their husband's wealth. So they were administrators of all this land, all the all these holdings. And so they would they would have this land and then they'd marry a new husband who frequently would end up dying. And so now they have all these expanding holdings. And when the Spartan mother would die, those holdings would pass on to their children, male and female. So this gave certain Spartan families a lot of concentrated wealth. And if something came up, uh, some kind of law came up that the Spartan women, the society of Spartan women didn't like, they just throw their money at it, throw their money at the different representatives, and they would just change their position on the law and it would be shot down. So they wielded a tremendous amount of influence through the, uh, through the purse strings and the holdings of all the lands and all the helots that this was something that really horrified a lot of the other Greek states. Is women having an influence on politics? What? 
no, absolutely was unacceptable for them. So that's another reason why they were so thoroughly antagonistic. But that's something that you can put into your hobgoblin society. Now, you can still make hob uh, hobgoblin women warriors as well, but they also have a significant financial uh, uh, interest and holdings if they are not I and mean, they still you know however you want to f uh, flex around it you can but if they are stay at home more or less then they are going to have a significant buildup of financial wealth and status and being allowed to remarry into different families and uh, acquire different husbands over time as their husbands die off that really gives them a significant amount of, of uh, financial status in their society. Now, another thing with the uh, Spartans that was fairly interesting is despite their antagonistic stance and how they would look down on other Greek city-states, they still saw the need to try to form some kind of alliance because however militarily mighty they were, they couldn't stand alone. And so they did become good statesmen in spite of how much of a pain in the ass they could be to their neighbors and to far further away city-states like Athens. So they became excessively good diplomats. Another reason why they were good at this, not just because of their antagonistic stance, but because of the high number of helots in their population. They had such a high number of slaves that they were worried about slave revolts. Another reason for them to focus so much on their military might. Individual Spartan warriors had to be so excessively good and well-trained and well-armored, not only to deal with threats abroad and conquer the rest of Greece, but to keep everybody in control and back in line back at home. So that was another reason why they focused so much on their military and their statescraft on developing their foreign policy and their diplomacy so well is because they wanted to have certain assurances that, hey, if our troops go out, we want you to not attack, not only not attack us, but also come to help us in case our helots rise up in revolt. We'll do the same thing for you whenever we're not at campaign or whenever we're in a position to be able to help. So they would develop this particular network of alliances between several different city states. And that's why when uh, Persia threatened Greece, that the Athenians turned to the Spartans and wanted to bring them into the fold for their alliance to stand against the Persians when the Persians began invading is because by pulling in Sparta, they would pull in several other city states into this uh, uh, communal defense, this larger defense network of standing against the Persians. And they needed to do this because several of the other Greek city-states saw that they had more in common with the Persians than they did with their fellow Greeks, honestly. So they had no problem standing and siding with the Persians. So it's definitely much more complicated than just, oh, Persia invading all of Greece. Uh, there's more to it than that. But the uh, Spartans, again, had a very good network of diplomacy, had a good diplomatic thing going for them. But it's important to note that later on in their history, particularly once they were conquered by the Romans, they were a shadow of their former selves. Just that focus and unchanging, unflinching, unflinching nature and that focus on their military might left them with nothing, left them with very little. They were just kind of a uh, an archaeological curiosity as far as the as far as the Romans were concerned they weren't a threat the Spartans literally militaried themselves so hard that they ground themselves to nothing they were just a boogeyman a, a story of legends that were told to people you know the mythical Spartans those mighty 300 standing at the gates of Thermopylae but they were they were just a curiosity as far as anybody was concerned by the time the Romans conquered the region. And so, you know, that tells you a lot about how those societies could decline. So this can help you to kind of come up with more protections, that, uh, societal protections in that, you know, uh, an emphasis on a broader range of skills, maybe less of an emphasis on the military, not so much so that you take 
take the heart out of what we know about the Spartans, but make more room for tradesmen, for merchantmen, for farmers. And farmers were how farmland were how the uh, Greek warriors supported themselves, how the Spartans supported themselves too, how they could afford all these things and afford the ability to uh, go and just dedicate themselves to training like this. But you know, a more broad emphasis, just to have that infrastructural societal support to really properly back it all would be important to make a functioning, longer lasting society. Now, another thing to note with the Spartans that was kind of a strange cultural thing with them. Well, maybe not so strange when you think about it, but the hoplite was considered to be the only valid form of warrior and only Spartan men were allowed to be hoplites. And, and you had to be able to afford the greaves, the arm guards, the cuirass, the, uh, um, the bronze shield, the spear, the xiphos, you know, the Corinthian helmet. They had to be able to afford and have all of those things and then they were focused solely into the military and those were the only real warriors by Spartan standards. Everybody else was lesser, a coward, not a real warrior by their standards. So all the helots that they brought with them to the, uh, to the hot gates, to Thermopylae, they were there with them, about 4,000, 5,000 or so, supporting the 300 Spartans. But the Spartans still go, we only sent 300 warriors to the Persians, and look at how long we held. What about the 4,500 or so helots that you had with you? Oh, yeah, they were there, but they just shot those weird little bow things. They used slings and whatever other swords and spears we had lying around. They weren't really warriors, even though they were some of the last ones to die on the battlefield they died surrounding their king um and you know the same thing with the athenians the athenians had had uh, their own hoplites present there but they weren't really full-time hoplites they weren't real warriors some of them were blacksmiths poets uh, well metal workers rather than blacksmiths but they were fishermen they were, were in all of these other professions other than being full-time warriors like the Spartans. And so that kind of snobbery, that kind of elitism is something you can easily feed into as an aspect as of a part of this hobgoblin society. These are full-time soldiers. They are dedicated. They are hardened. They are lethal. And anybody who is anything even slightly less is beneath them and is only worthy of derision and scorn. And they'll only begrudgingly admit that other warriors from other foreign societies might actually be worthy of some of their respect. They're still nothing compared to these Spartan hobgoblins, but still, that knight who's come from a long line of storied and proud knights, they might be worthy of, of such considerations. But what do you think? Go on down to the comments below and let me know your thoughts. Did you like today's video? Did you dislike it? Go on down and let me know your thoughts down below. Hit those like or dislike buttons. Joining me now are both my apprentices, my apprentice and journeyman storyteller, bringing our new familiar. Yeah, very calm, very quiet. Uh, could you kids say hello? Hello. You say hello? Hello. <laughs> Uh, if you Addy, 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 Atticus, Nora. and that's your sister Nora. Yes. Well, I think we'll wrap things up here for now, folks. If you're new here to the channel, go on down there, hit the subscribe button, and become a regular member here at the Gamers Den. But with all that, of course I will. With all that said, hey, don't don't push. That wasn't kind. You don't push. Sister doesn't push you. Anyways, subscribe down below. You folks have yourselves a good night. You can tell me.